All right, good afternoon, everyone. Is everyone fired up and ready to go? All right. So how many people were here for uh, the, uh, the circuits panel that we had? I want to know how many of my jokes I can reuse. <laughs> uh, uh, my name's Tom Khalil. I work for uh, the White House National Economic Council and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, spectrum today. Um, and in particular, uh, the opportunities to uh, promote uh, and democratize innovation. Uh, so what, what are the new ways in which innovation in the, in the wireless and, and uh, spectrum management areas are, are beginning to happen? Uh, so we have three excellent speakers, um, and they're, they're going to uh, give uh, a, an overview of, of some of the work that we've been doing in this area, uh, and then I'm going to ask them uh, some hopefully interesting questions. Uh, but I just wanted to start off a little bit and, and say that um, I think one of the things that is really exciting right now is the extent to which we can uh, democratize innovation. So rather than thinking of innovation as, as something that is just the province of uh, uh, large corporations, the extent to which uh, individuals uh, can get involved in the, uh, in the innovation process. And so uh, last year, um, President Obama had the first ever uh, Maker Faire at, at the White House, so we had uh, an 18-foot uh, robotic giraffe uh, from uh, Burning Man. Uh, we had uh, two, the president met two young girls whose motto is, why get a paper route when you can start your own robotics company? Um, and one of the things that is driving that is, first of all, j the growing number of people who are interested in not only being consumers of things, but producers of things, the fact that the tools that are necessary to design and make things are getting cheaper and easier to use, uh, that people can have shared access to these tools by going to a tech shop or a fab lab or a makerspace. Um, and th this is something that the president has been focusing on because of the potential to promote mindsets like uh, creativity and tinkering and self-efficacy, uh, the impact that it could have on getting more young boys and girls excited about STEM and advanced manufacturing and design, and the role that it could play in lowering the barriers to entry in the same way that uh, individuals and small teams can now use uh, the LAMP stack open source software and cloud computing to be able to start a uh, startup in the, in the digital world uh, for, for thousands of dollars as opposed to millions of dollars uh, whether we could see that same phenomena occur, uh, not only in the digital world, but in the physical world. Um, so that's one of the things that we, that we want to talk about is what are the op new opportunities to, uh, to have more uh, decentralized and, and uh, distributed and, and democratized innovation. So we have uh, three great speakers. Uh, we have Elad Alan, who is an associate professor in electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley, go Bears. Uh, and he's also the uh, co-director of the Berkeley Wireless uh, Research Center. Um, and he works on energy efficient integrated systems and looking uh, at circuits, devices, uh, and communications techniques for, for designing these systems. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Tom Rondeau, who is the uh, lead developer for a really important uh, open source uh, project for software uh, design radio called uh, GNU Radio, and is also a consultant on uh, signal processing and, and wireless communications. Uh, and um, then we have uh, Matt Edis, who is the president and founder of uh, Edis Research, which is part of NAS uh, National Instruments. And he's the creator of the Universal Software Radio Peripheral, or USRP, uh, which is now in use in over 110 countries. Um, so you must, you must have quite the a passport at this point. Uh, I, I would like to go visit them. <laughs> uh, which is being used for uh, cellular and satellite communications, radio astronomy, medical imaging, wildlife uh, tra uh, tracking, and, and many other uh, applications that he'll talk about. So. Each of the panelists is going to give uh, a 10-minute presentation 
uh, and then I'm going to ask them some questions, but uh, we hope that they will uh, interrupt each other and, uh, and that we'll get, get a real good discussion going as well. So, Elad, over to you. Great. So thanks uh, for the opportunity to, to be here and speak to you all today. Um, I'm glad that Tom started out things with a couple of jokes. I'm going to keep with that tradition. Uh, you know, so I was told that I should be talking about design for the masses, and you know, I'm not sure if I'll exactly do that. But you know, when the director of MTO tells you to do something, and you know, you get some funding from them, you generally say, "All right, uh, I'll go do that." Um, I will, however, try and cast this a little bit, particularly in the wireless side of things, and tell you a bit about what it is I think specifically about wireless that makes design hard, uh, and then tell you a bit about some of the work that we've been doing to try and address at least one piece of the bottleneck there. So just for those of you who are perhaps, you know, been, I don't know, I guess if your head's buried under the sand for a little while, uh, you, you probably know or you probably have heard uh, very often that, you know, wireless is kind of this very crowded thing in terms of the spectrum. And it may or may not actually really be crowded, but from a regulation standpoint, most of the spectrum basically you can't touch um, unless you've got a really, really big paycheck and it's probably bigger than anyone even in this room would be able to sign. You know, we maybe had SecDef here yesterday. He, he could have done some of this. But, you know, for most of us, there's no way we can actually go and buy a piece of spectrum and say, no, this is mine. I get to use it. So the result of that is that if you want to do anything in the wireless space, and again, you're not one of the people that actually owns the spectrum, um, you pretty much have to go into one of these unlicensed bands. Now, there are several of them, and there's actually a pretty reasonable amount of bandwidth available there. But nonetheless, everybody and their brother wants to use them. So you end up in the situation that was kind of very similar to what Bill Chappell was showing earlier today in his presentation, which is kind of this cocktail party scenario, where everyone is trying to talk, everyone is kind of you know, trying to use the same sort of shared resource, in this case, the air and you know, audio waves. But I want to kind of, let's say, give you the flavor a little bit more about what the real problem ends up being here, which is that it's not even just that you're sort of trying to talk to your nearest neighbor and everyone's talking at the same time. There's people that may want to do very different things than what you want to do. For example, they may want to communicate over a much, much longer distance. And so you might have literally the equivalent of this like rock band concert right next to your you know, person to person conversation. Okay? So to be slightly more technical here, I'm kind of quoting kind of the audio, let's say, decibel levels associated with these things. And there's about you know, 55 dB difference between the two. That's actually kind of even relatively low in terms of the type of interference we might see in the wireless context. Okay, so the point here is that a lot of the challenge is really just coming down to the fact that we have to deal with this interference if we're all going to be in this same spectrum sort of region. So to be slightly more technical about it, uh, I want to kind of just highlight kind of two extremes in the design approach one may take to deal with this interference problem. So the one on the left is actually where most of the commercial products that we have in our hands, and particularly you know, in your mobile phones and things like that, that's kind of the approach that most of us take, which is, you know, again, I'm looking at this from a 40,000 foot kind of view, but it's basically say, put as much filtering as you can kind of in the front end somewhere before you get into the data conversion and successive processing, just so that everything in principle can be as efficient as possible, right? So that I'm really dealing only with the signal that I actually care about by the time I'm actually doing any heavy duty lifting. So again, most of the radios that we ourselves have are designed this way because it turns out to be generally the most energy efficient way of building things. Now the problem is that this really ends up requiring lots of quote unquote watchmakers. So people who are really expert in building these filters, expert in building all the analog mixed signal circuits, expert in you know, sort of getting all these things to work together, that's kind of, you know, sort of the style of design that we should be expecting there. On the other side, we have, you know, and again this is really at the extreme, on the other side, we can basically say, well, forget it. I'm not going to deal with any filtering in analog. I'm just going to sort of build the world's best data converter, grab absolutely everything that I can, and then deal with it digitally later. Okay, now, this is a very attractive proposition. And in fact, this is where most of the so-called software-defined radios, this is closer to where they live. By the way, neither one of these is exactly correct. But this is kind of closer to the vision of what the software-defined radio is trying to get to. And there's good reason here, because you know, once you sort of shove all this into digital bits, it's much easier to sort of do the processing, to sort of make things configurable, programmable, figure out what it is you want to do after the fact. Okay? Now, I should be clear, it is not at all to say that building this you know, grab everything approach is an easy thing to do. That's actually extremely hard. But the good news is that you build it once, and you can then use it for a plethora of different applications. Right? And that's exactly what you're going to be hearing some more about in some of these successive talks. Okay, so again, I, I want to just spend a little bit of time on software-defined radios for those who haven't sort of paid attention to these things. You know, there's really been, I think, absolutely tremendous progress in their capabilities. And really, they've been, I think, 
kind of a whole game changer, not only in terms of access for the more general population of people, but even for large corporations as a mechanism to enable you to actually do advanced development and prototyping. Because right? you can imagine, if I'm going to spin some new wireless thing, I'd like to be able to actually get out in the field and try it out before I have to build all my custom hardware, which you know sunk a few millions, if not even tens of millions of dollars, into it. So again, this has really been a huge game changer. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, you still end up often wanting to build a more customized solution. And the reason for that is that, generally speaking, the sort of power envelope of these things, as you can imagine, it's too large for something like you know, a mobile phone, let alone a sort of you know, embedded Internet of Things, you know, a tiny little device that you might want to have. So again, if you sort of look at, let's say, a not particularly um, you know, a, a developer without you know, tons of dollars in the bank, they're usually stuck basically with utilizing existing radios and standards. They were developed for markets with enough revenue in them that people can justify the development cost, but it may not really do exactly what you want. Okay? And again, that the problem all there comes down to, developing your own custom radio circuit is just basically too expensive, at least today. So there's lots of challenges actually associated with this, but I want to focus in on one particular aspect of this, which is I kind of said, you know, to be more efficient, we wanted to move some more of the, let's say, processing or the filtering, really, into the analog mix signal domain. So let's just focus in on how we can potentially break down some of the barriers that make that piece of the design expensive. So to do that, we need to look a little bit at just how design is done today in the analog mix signal side. And unfortunately, one of the big problems here is that the human is essentially in the loop on just about everything that needs to happen. Okay, so if some small change in the specification sort of you know, gets made even fairly late or advanced in the design process, the expert basically has to come back and essentially redo everything on their own manually. Okay? You can imagine this takes a lot of time. It takes having the expert there in the first place, and it's clearly not a very efficient way of doing things. So in order to accelerate the design process, the approach that we've really been exploring and we're sort of continuing to push on is to basically tell designers, as you know, Alberto San Giovanni was saying earlier today, look, there's a new discipline that you really have to adopt. And that discipline, in some senses, is actually very straightforward. It's to say, don't just go and give me whatever your final output of the design is. Instead, what I want you to do is write down in a programmatic, executable way the steps you took to come up with that design given the specifications and other things you were, you were sort of handed in the first place, okay? So in other words, what the designer should be delivering to you is not the quote unquote instance, it's not the individual thing, it's a generator that would produce any one of those types of instances given the appropriate set of specifications at the input, okay? So the specific instantiation of this that we worked on we call the Berkeley Analog Generator, or BAG for short. This is really targeted for analog mix signal integrated circuit design. Um, but there's one other sort of aspect of this that I want to highlight, which is really particularly challenging, is that you know, when you write generators, you can do this not just for analog, it could be for digital, you know, RF, and et cetera. But the real challenge with some of these, let's say, analog and RF kinds of things is that at the end of the day, your implementation is not just sort of you know, what you wrote down as like a circuit schematic. It's the real physical layout. It's really you know, where are the wires, how are they connected, you know, how far apart are they, things like this. Okay, so that makes this really challenging because you have to sort of keep track of all these things down at the very physical layer to actually get the right functionality on top of it. Whereas with digital, you know, there's a few things you kind of check and then you can actually prove that it really will work. So to address this particular bottleneck, we're actually very much playing the same trick, which is to say that most analog designers kind of know how the sort of physical implementation, what it should look like, meaning kind of the floor plan for that design. And if you can get them to then capture that write it in a way that is then programmable and flexible but follows the intent or follows the same methodology they themselves would have used, you can actually get things back that indeed scale pretty well as you change sort of the underlying parameters to get different instances. Now, there are a few common floor plans that we've identified that we went and sort of captured to make the process of creating these programmable layouts easier. But even if you don't have that, uh, fortunately there was some technology developed by industry where essentially you can do correct by construction manipulations of layout. Again, in a, fair, in a way that's fairly natural. You can say things like, well, put these things you know, kind of as close together as you can. You don't exactly have to know which rules it is that are interacting to do that. So just to sort of tell you that, or, or show you that this really can actually work in practice, uh, my group has been sort of working on this for, for a, a number of years now, and has actually used this methodology to produce pretty much state-of-the-art performance integrated circuits. So I've shown a few examples here, things like you know, very high-speed chip-to-chip -chip links, uh, you know, various 
RF types of circuits, you know, clock generation circuits, things of this nature. And by the way, most of these were actually sort of published in these you know, top circuits conferences for the circuit itself. Okay, so the point here is that if you follow this methodology and you follow sort of this approach of capturing what the designer is actually doing for themselves, you can actually get very high quality results out of it. So with that, I just want to kind of quickly summarize. Hopefully you guys are all very well aware that you know, the, the, the desire for using the wireless spectrum is just continuing to explode and you know, there's, no, there's no end in sight for that. But that's then driven a lot of demand for essentially having, we would like to really be able to build much more customized types of solutions to meet the needs of all these different applications that we're trying to build on top of this wireless spectrum. But again, unfortunately, today at least, building a custom circuit or solution is just still far too expensive, at least if you really want to get it all the way down to that sort of you know, custom circuit that really gets you the energy efficiency that you want. So as I hope to try and convince you, I think that generators are one of the key steps that we can take to actually address this design bottleneck, where again, the idea of a generator is you have the designers executably capture the methodology that they used in order to be able to then repeat that when you just are changing the specifications that you're trying to get. And we've demonstrated that approach with a few state-of-the-art integrated circuits. Now, just to say a little bit about kind of where this would lead, particularly from a community building standpoint, you know, once you have this kind of methodology, there's sort of a dual, let's say, benefit that I think you get. You know, so today, if we're in the situation where the only people who can really sort of build these things are these you know, watchmaker-type experts, where obviously there's a small number of them and they're not very productive, in the future, if you really adopt this generator-based methodology, that would multiply the productivity of the expert watchmaker, right? Because they can use that generator to generate many more instances than they would have been able to do manually on their own. And similarly, once a strong library of these generators is available, People who are not necessarily the watchmakers, but understand what it is that they would like to get, would be able to use those generators to actually create other new instances that they could then use within their larger overall application. So with that, thank you all for your attention. Great, thanks for uh, letting me speak today. Uh, so I'm Tom Rondo, I run the GNU Radio Project. Uh, it's software-defined radio, open, free and open source software. Uh, that's really letting us get uh, iterating faster, uh, generating new ideas really easily within software uh, and commodity hardware and on desktop and laptop PCs. Uh, I would like to take us back if I can move forward, thank you. Uh, but I'd like to take us back to uh, the early days of radio. Uh, now this is kind of a general truth in, uh, in a lot of areas of science uh, and technology research, but um, in radio in particular, which is something I study, we, the, the, uh, one of the most important impactful discoveries early on was Professor Hertz demonstrating the uh, electromagnetic radiation as a medium of, uh, uh, of, of transmitting power in radio waves across uh, uh, the air. Um, he didn't actually really discover that, he showed it, right? Uh, Maxwell had proved this early on. What he was doing is showing Maxwell's proof is a real thing uh, and showing us what we could do if we have the apparatuses uh, and the implementation in which to, uh, to explore that space. So that's what we've been doing in GNU Radio. Uh, software Radio has pushed us there, and GNU Radio helped commoditize this idea of being able to, uh, uh, to really investigate and interrogate the spectrum in new and interesting ways. Uh, so going back 14 years with the original kind of success of GNU Radio when it first came out, which is the ability to demodulate uh, digital TV signals, ATSC. Uh, so we were able to play with that really early on, and then move forward from there to get this into the hands of people who wanted to do more interesting things than, uh, than digital t uh, TV demodulation. So that's where I picked it up in about 2004 or so uh, as a graduate student, interested in this whole idea of cognitive radio, or really more generally dynamic spectrum access uh, and access to, uh, to changing, flexibly changing frequency, amplitude, protocols, uh, just all the information and, and communications theory aspects of, uh, of a signal. So here we have something that's kind of getting close to that, right? That's LTE uplink uh, signal that I captured on my own. Uh, but then I was able to play with that, and manipulate it, put it next to signals that it was never supposed to be put next to, uh, and see what could happen. So this control, this very fine-grained control now over time and frequency, location within the spectrum, is what we're trying to open up within this, uh, this world of communications. Uh, this is a radically different uh, model of developing signal processing and uh, actual over-the-air radio uh, communications. Uh, this is where we're trying to get to with this ability to, to think like the original tinkers of radio that started with this idea of 
uh, trying to see what happens if you can actually just, you know, manipulate and figure out what's going on in the, the radio spectrum. Uh, we started a lot of this back in my, you know, the labs, which are half a million to a mil you know, millions of dollar labs full of gigantic test equipment, uh, which I think kind of walls off the community from, uh, the general community, from iterating and adapting and trying to figure out what's really going on uh, with signals, with signal processing, uh, with different radio waveforms. I mean, really, we've been left with these black boxes, you know, black box like this. It's a shiny black box, um, but, uh, but it's kind of out of our reach as far as what's happening inside. And so we're, we're now going into this mode of, uh, of being able to figure out what's going on inside and, uh, and what we can do with that kind of an access. Because I think the future of radio is going to get weird. It's going to get a lot more complicated, a lot more ugly than it is today. We have all these standards, and this is just what's available, uh, a subset of what's available today. But as we're moving on to this whole concept of future wireless uh, mobile communications and this internet of things, all those things are going to come out with their own way of doing something, their own way of, uh, of exploring and, uh, and transmitting data into the, uh, into the ether. Uh, so what are we going to do about our ability to understand that, our ability to coexist with all of these different types of, uh, of standards and waveforms? New standards even, maybe some, uh, some indigenous standard that we've designed, we've designed ourselves because it was cheaper to do that than, uh, uh, than try to model something else that was, uh, that was out there. These things are happening. We're seeing all sorts of FSK modems coming out and, uh, and being deployed for, uh, with different protocols and different, uh, uh, different behaviors. So this is a list of uh, the GNU radio community, uh, which is made up of, you know, we have experts from research labs and industry. We have uh, university uh, research teams and university students. Uh, we also just have, some of these were just created by uh, amateur enthusiasts uh, who are interested in a particular waveform. So all of these things are now capable uh, of, uh, of being explored in new ways from a security, from an efficiency perspective, uh, and just from an understanding of what's going on, especially again with this coexistence as a, as a major problem. So the, uh, uh, the, the community is, is really adapting to this uh, and iterating on what we're doing and, and what's out there as far as the spectrum is concerned. Now, of course, what this means is now we have access to all these different types of waveforms, waveforms which uh, signals which may be carrying important information. So that also leads to one of the negative sides of this kind of, uh, of work, which is the, uh, the security, information security side of, uh, of this kind of commodification of signals. <clears throat> but I think if you listen, we can mend this in a way that, uh, uh, that helps us from the scientific perspective of analyzing and understanding it as a, as a general community, not just a community of users, but a community of engineers, technologists, and scientists. Uh, so here's an example of, uh, of a study that I did. Uh, I review a lot of papers, and this was for an IEEE DiSpan uh, conference last year. Uh, I was given this paper. I didn't believe some of the claims that were inside of it, but they gave me enough information that I could sit down within GNU Radio within minutes. I was actually able to recreate their idea and work on that and see if it was going to work. Now, it wasn't even just a simulation. I put this through those radios, the radios that you'll hear about next, the uh, USRPs, to transmit over the air. So there's two signals in there, a wideband signal that was notched out to allow a narrowband communication system to, to operate inside of there. So I could prove that both those signals could operate together based on their idea. I could sign off on that paper and have it published, but what that showed me is the use of scientific reproduction of signal processing that we're now capable of doing, and this is just in my, my office at, in Vermont, you know, my home office in Vermont. So not a huge lab, but a, you know, a single researcher on his own being able to, uh, to, to properly investigate this and then lead that to, uh, to, to be published to a larger community of people who can learn and discover from this. So we have all of these uh, capabilities now uh, in which to study this. And here are a few, like, uh, few success stories uh, that have been published in the recent past. The uh, top left there is the Spectrum Challenge. Now, if you've seen in the demo room, they're showing a, a video of that running there. That was a DARPA Spectrum Challenge from a couple of years ago, where we actually had 98 univers uh, teams, university and individuals, uh, competing uh, to try to figure out how to develop new, more, new forms of communication uh, to operate within the spectrum, to share the spectrum and to coexist in new ways, uh, many of which was done within GNU Radio. Now, the second one, the middle one there, that's one of my favorite stories in the past year, when there was this uh, NASA satellite from about 40 years ago that uh, was in this comet orbit, and uh, you know, comet orbits are weird and long, but it eventually came back, except we forgot how to, uh, how to talk to it. So 
within weeks, uh, a group raised some money, put together some uh, usurp equipment, put together a GNU radio application, took it down to Arecibo, the largest single aperture uh, radio dish in the world, and started communicating with this, uh, this, this satellite that nobody else could communicate with. So the rapidity with which we were able to recover and revive the, uh, our ability to uh, talk to the ISEE satellite, uh, I think really blew me away and blew a number of people away. Now, bottom there, that's what I do now in my spare time in hotel rooms as I travel around the world uh, talking about and, and working on Guinea Radio. Uh, we're now porting it to Android. So that's me actually transmitting uh, an FM through my Android device over a user, capturing it through my laptop, and so you can see the display there. So now, Instead of my half a million dollar lab uh, as a graduate student, with just a few thousand dollars worth of equipment, a laptop that I already have, and, and, uh, and some commodity hardware, uh, I can start doing things in the spectrum and, uh, that we've never been able to do before within that mode. Uh, so I can just move anywhere that I want uh, throughout the world and start playing with signals. Uh, signals that exist, signals that I want to exist. So really throughout all of this, uh, I think, uh, I love this quote from, uh, from Professor Hertz here, trying to figure out what we can do with radio. I think we can do a whole lot with radio, more than we've ever understood that we can do in the past. Uh, we can, we can uh, iterate, we can observe, we can uh, diagnose, uh, and we can really start to do a, a more scientific and engineering approach uh, to signal processing, and we can leverage a community of users and enthusiasts and people with uh, with new ways of, uh, of thinking about signals, new creativity in the way that we, we, uh, we play with them uh, and what we can do with them uh, through these uh, projects like GNU Radio. Thank you. So um, I became involved with uh, the GNU Radio project very shortly after its founding in 2001. And we did a lot of really interesting things. Tom uh, uh, mentioned the ATSC television decoding. Uh, we had done FM radios and a few other things. But uh, there was no really uh, interesting um, hardware to use with that. We were sort of cobbling together a bunch of uh, different uh, uh, evaluation boards, RF evaluation boards, data acquisition systems. But really, it, it was no, uh, there was no good easily available software-defined radio, certainly not at any sort of a reasonable price. So uh, I, uh, you know, in, in going around and talking at conferences about software-defined radio, uh, I, I put this concept up uh, in my slides near the end usually, and I, and I said, this, this to me would be the ultimate software radio device. And I, I begged the audience, somebody, somebody build this. I want to use this because there's all these exciting things I want to uh, experiment with. Uh, MIMO communications, OFDM, and in particular, spectrum access and dynamic spectrum access, uh, spectrum sharing, that sort of thing, uh, because spectrum policy was of interest to me. Um, and now I, I went to a, quite a few conferences. No, nobody took me up on building this. And at some point, I, uh, in, in 2003, decided to, that if I was ever going to get to use this thing, I was going to have to build it myself. So uh, I started out, I uh, worked with some people in the GNU Radio community, uh, you know, got a lot of ideas from that, that crowd and, um, you know, discussed the design as it progressed uh, uh, with the community. And it, it really was a, a, a group effort. And so uh, in, sometime in 2003, uh, ha I came up with what would become the USERP-1, the, the first USRP. And, uh, you know, played around with it for a little while. And, and at this point, I decide, okay, well, somebody's got to make these things. So, I, I shopped the design around to a bunch of places, and I said, here, just take this. Don't give me any money. Just build it, please. And I went to a number of electronics manufacturers, including some that were sort of in this space, and uh, none, none really seemed interested in it. So um, I said, like, no, really, you don't have to give me money, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's free, it's open source, just, just go build it. And, and it just didn't happen. And so, uh, again, I was, uh, I was like, well, what am I going to do? And I, I was lucky enough to find... Um, some, uh, a, a group of people at uh, University of Utah who had some NSF money and I was able to uh, be uh, a part of that, do some consulting with them. And, uh, to, and so they, the production of this device and its early uh, support was all uh, supported by this NSF money. And that enabled me to quit the day job which was designing Bluetooth chips and uh, be able to concentrate on this full time. 
And, uh, you know, at first I was very excited. We had, you know, uh, 20 people bought them, you know, at, at the beginning. And, uh, you know, but I had to build 100 uh, to make it at all viable. And I was really afraid that uh, I was going to get stuck with the other 80. Uh, and um, luckily, uh, there seemed to be a, a good amount of interest in it. And after a couple of years, I was able to, um, to, to go full time and, and uh, uh, make, uh, make the, the usurp. Uh, a, a product line and, and start hiring a team and, uh, and really properly commercializing it. Um, but I want to give you an idea of, of where we were. So this was 2003, 2004 timeframe. Uh, this device would give you eight megahertz of bandwidth to your, uh, to your external computer that would be connected by USB. And it would do two by two MIMO because uh, MIMO was definitely a key area of interest of mine. Uh, and that FPGA in the middle was an Altera Cyclone 1 and it had all of 12,000 flip-flops, and it had absolutely no multiplier unit. So if you wanted to do, a, to do a complex multiply, you would have to do it in the fabric of the FPGA, and that took up 25% of the FPGA for one multiplier. So, so that's 2003 and four. Um, fast forward to today, we have a whole family of products uh, with bandwidths up to 160 megahertz and will soon be at 500 megahertz. Uh, we've got small handheld devices, uh, which have one here, that this gives you also two by two MIMO and 50 megahertz of bandwidth, and it has a whole computer built in, so you don't even need an external one. So these, uh, these changes have uh, really been enabled by um, one, uh, a, a, a community of users who, and, and, uh, and developers who, who've, who've made applications for this and made it um, you know, sort of a viable technology and, and, and the community uh, forming around it, and the other part has been uh, really the advancements in the semiconductor world, in particular in the RF uh, semiconductor world, uh, bringing uh, you know, much greater capabilities, and in particular very highly integrated RF devices, which make uh, you know, small handheld devices like this possible. Uh, and, and so you know, when I first started, we had a lot of people saying things like, well, um, you know, when am I going to have a software-defined cell phone? When am I going to be able to carry one around in my pocket? And, and it was always like, well, that's probably about 10 years away. And, and it actually worked out kind of, kind of right. We have the software-defined cell phone now and, um, and, and, and a lot of users in this community. So we're, we're very proud of that. So uh, USRPs are used all over the place, uh, you know, 113 countries. But, but really, it, this, is, this is really a testament to the GNU radio community and, and SDR in general. Um, some of the things I'm most pr uh, proud of are, are, are really what our customers have done with the devices. Um, really the first actual proof of that these technologies have worked over the air in the case of uh, gesture sensing, massive MIMO, and uh, interference alignment and cancellation. And, uh, and so really it's fulfilling our vision of allowing anybody to experiment at low cost with radio and be able to, to take new technologies and prove them in the real world and not just simulations very quickly. So I'm going to go through a, a few of those, uh, those successes of our community uh, just to give you an idea of where, uh, what people are doing with the devices, where they are. So now th this picture looks like a, a, a really good optical telescope picture of the moon. Um, and, uh, it, it, and it actually looked even better before we reduced the resolution on it. Um, but it's a, uh, it's, it was actually taken with a single dish radar, uh, um, uh, uh, radar astronomy setup that's in uh, Finland and it, it, by an institute there. And uh, it was single dish that's, it was, I think it was only about 20 or 30 meters, so not, not the world's biggest dish. And yet uh, they were able to prototype and develop these new uh, uh, computational methods for producing this sort of resolution in a radar image despite having only a single aperture. Um, and so, so that one's really exciting. That was done with USRPs and of like a, a one megawatt transmitter, or one megawatt amplifier in front of them, of course. Um, but uh, a, a lot of impressive capabilities, all with uh, GNU Radio and, uh, and some smart members of the community. Uh, this is another one, uh, Massive MIMO. Uh, one of the real big uh, areas in 5G research, which is intended to be the next generation uh, cellular standard, is uh, so-called Massive MIMO. Up until now, MIMO has been uh, two, three, four antennas, maybe eight in a, in a really high-end system uh, in LTE and uh, 802.11. Um, but in, in the future, the, the goal is to be able to do hundreds of antennas. And so this is a system that was set up based, built out of USERPs that does, uh, in this case, 100 antenna MIMO. Uh, and so you have 100 antennas, all, all 
transmitting uh, to multiple users simultaneously. So they're all synchronized. And what you're able to do is to send different signals by forming different beams. And, some, and those beams aren't necessarily conical beams like you would expect. Uh, but because of the multipath environment, they're more uh, uh, clouds. And so they're able to send clouds of signal to 10 to 20 different users in the same spectrum at the same time. And this leads to a 10 to 20 X uh, uh, performance improvement. And this goes, scales with the number of antennas quite well. So uh, people are looking at even, you know, multiple hundreds of antennas now uh, in these systems. And this was really the first proof that you could actually do this beyond uh, papers and simulations and, uh, and, and math. And so this has made it practical uh, to do that sort of thing. Uh, another exciting application, uh, and, and, and this, this sort of gives you an idea of, of what, you, um, you know, what you can do at low cost and, uh, and quickly with software radio because uh, passive radar is, is a very interesting application, but it's not the sort of thing that is going to drive the volumes of, of uh, uh, enough uh, units to make semiconductor makers uh, you know, make a chip specifically to do this sort of thing. And so software-defined radio allows you to do things where you don't have, uh, e even if it's wildly successful, it will be a tiny market. And, and that would be very hard if you had to do ASICs for everything. So software radio makes a lot of this possible. In this case, it's passive radar uh, using signals that um, are, uh, in this case, bouncing from uh, FM radio and uh, TV station uh, transmitters on shore, bouncing off uh, boats up to, uh, uh, in this case, I believe it was a couple hundred miles offshore, um, and, uh, and, and positioning them and determining where they are. And this, is, this is, uh, can be used, of course, for uh, sort of uh, homeland security and, and uh, security types of applications, as well as, uh, um, you know, productive use in, as, uh, you know, in, in commercial shipping uh, radars. Uh, this, is a, this is a fun one. This is uh, from a paper. This is in 2007. You can see on the left there's a USERP-1, and that, that uh, circular or cylindrical metal device is a pacemaker. And uh, this, this paper uh, was done by a group from uh, University of Washington and uh, won a Best Paper Award at uh, the Oakland Security Conference. But they, they were able to show that, uh, that the link, the wireless link that the doctor uses to control a pacemaker and program it was completely insecure for several brands of pacemaker. And part of that happens because radio used to be this black art that only a few people knew how to do and nobody had access to the technology to, uh, to do this. And so um, they, they left the links completely unauthenticated and unencrypted. And, and so what they demonstrated in this paper is that you what, could what actually. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, what could possibly <laughs> go wrong? So they, they demonstrated that you could actually send, uh, there's a mode on these pacemakers to, to induce fibrillation. And the reason is because that's used, the doctor tests if it's connected properly during the operation. But it's not locked down afterwards, and you could, from quite some distance actually, send someone who has one of these pacemakers into fibrillation. And so clearly a major security risk, and uh, this is, I think, one of the first sort of wireless medical device security issues uh, that, that you know, received some attention. And uh, thankfully, people are really looking into this now. But this, this enabled a team of researchers who weren't radio people, they were security people, to, to pick up a, a, an inexpensive system and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and investigate its security. And so we, we opened this, the world of wireless up to security researchers. The, the picture on the right I had to include there, um, that's actually, the, the, the pacemakers themselves don't function unless they detect a human heart. And so on the right is a, a simulator for a human heart. It's, a, it's some ground beef and uh, bacon. And if you need the proportions, they're in the paper um, to get the right conductivity. And it could, I had to put it in there because bacon, right? So, <laughs> so um, this is a, another example of uh, some applications uh, that our, uh, our users have done. Um, the, uh, the, uh, everybody's watched the Natural Ge uh, National Geographic channel, and you've seen a scientist with headphones on, an antenna, a Yagi antenna, walking around trying to pinpoint where the, in this case, a Galapagos turtle is, and uh, a, you know, for for research purposes, and and that's really cool, but it's not terribly efficient. So a group of uh, researchers in uh, upstate New York uh, used USRPs and mounted them on towers and used the MIMO capabilities to do some direction finding. And we're able to produce a system that you could go to a web page and look up the, uh, the, the locations of all the tagged um, muskrats in the greater Ithaca area of, of New York. 
And uh, again, this is an application that there's not really much of a market for, but software radio and free software in particular opens it up. We then had another group at the uh, University of Illinois that did a very similar thing, uh, but with uh, Canadian geese that migrate through their area. And so, um, so we had two different users uh, do this. Now, um, I've talked a bit about community and, and the powers, uh, the powers of open source and, and, and uh, being able to build on each other, and, and that's been a big theme for me. I would, I would actually point to this example as kind of a failure uh, of that, because those two groups were decoding what were essentially the same modulation system from the same transmitters, but they each wrote that code independently. And one had completely finished it before the other even started, and they could have saved a lot of effort. But we had a breakdown in the system of sharing of this code, right? There was no commercial value in keeping that private. Um, it was just, it just didn't get out there, and so two separate groups had to uh, reinvent that wheel. And so uh, since then, we've, we've undertaken a lot of uh, things within GNU Radio Project to make it easier for people to share their code. Uh, we have a, a repository now, it's sort of like a, a, a GitHub for, uh, for GNU Radio, uh, where it, it links, it's called the CGRAN, the Comprehensive GNU Radio Network, and uh, you can post your application there with a minimum of pain. Um, still, we get a lot of people who are like, well, I don't want to, I'm embarrassed about my code, and they don't post it. But um, so, so that's something we, we still need to work on, I think, uh, to really get the power of, uh, of the system, of, of open source. But um, in any case, uh, 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 here, here's another wireless gesture recognition. This is, uses uh, Wi-Fi signals. Um, that are already in the environment, and so you can actually detect, uh, if you have a Wi-Fi access point in one room, a user in another room, and a, a, uh, a detector system in a third room, and you can detect people's hand motions and things like that, so you could you know, turn off your TV, sort of like a wireless clapper uh, kind of thing. And uh, the, this technology also, again, not, uh, became the basis of uh, a, um, you know, a, there, there's a commercial effort to, to, uh, to uh, implement this as well. So um, really a lot of why I came, oops, uh, why I came at uh, this is, uh, is uh, was I was interested in facilitating spectrum access. Certainly sort of running at us research and, and building more USRPs has kind of gotten in the way of me, you know, doing a lot of these other technologies, but I uh, live vicariously through our customers and, uh, and their successes. But I think that the keys to really being able to do this uh, are, are repeatable science. There's a lot of papers, there's a lot of, um, uh, work where you present some results, uh, but you don't, you, no one else can reproduce it. And there's not enough info about the methodology or anything like that. And so having open source code on a common platform really enables you to compare different systems and, uh, and um, uh, you know, build, build on each other's work so that we can, as a community, move forward. So um, with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Tom. Great. Or, or actually, you probably don't need to say that. Yes. Uh, so the first question that I wanted to ask folks is uh, to imagine that you've just uh, signed up for a tour of duty as a DARPA program manager. Uh, what is the uh, program that you would uh, most like to pitch and why? You want to take a crack right, at that? I'll, I guess I will start. Um, I'm glad that Linton is here in the room because uh, the first program would have started, I think, actually has the BAA out uh, now already. Um, and in particular, the, the, the first issue that, sort of that I'd really want to address is kind of this problem of how difficult it is to really actually do mixed signal, you know, complete SOCs. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's the craft BAA that, you know, is again out now that, that is largely kind of going that direction. Um, I think there's plenty more work to be done, but that, that's kind of the, the first one that, that I would have thought. Um, the other one is, is much more, let's say, on the spectrum side of things, but I think is trying to address a very related issue, which is um, if you paid kind of close attention to some of the things that Alberto San Giovanni was saying earlier this morning, you know, we were talking about kind of the internet of things and how expensive it's gonna be to actually build the infrastructure we need to support all of those. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's pretty clear that, you know, given that most of the revenue is not actually coming from the carriers, it's actually going to places like Amazon, Google, et cetera, that are really, you know, basically right. deriving that as a service, you know, kind of the model starts breaking in terms of who's actually gonna pay to develop that infrastructure. So I think if we start taking some of these ideas about both rapid design and software-defined radios and things like this, and obviously you know, new network architectures, I think it'd be really important for someone like DARPA, per perhaps, to think about you know, how can we actually come up with 
new technologies would actually enable essentially infrastructure that can be grown in a very organic way, mm -hmm. right? Where someone can just go and you know buy a piece of hardware and that automatically contributes to the overall infrastructure, as opposed to just okay, I get my one device and you know I have to rely on somebody else to actually get me connected mm -hmm. to the rest of the network. So like a bottom up mesh network type of yeah. So it's uh, it wouldn't be purely mesh because that on its own has uh, well known issues. Uh, you know you have mm -hmm. to do sort of rely on directionality. You have to do build some hierarchy mm -hmm. into it. Um, you know, you probably have to have some obviously dynamic spectral capabilities, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the basic idea, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'd also go into complexity as a big issue. Uh, I talked to a lot of people in uh, military outfits uh, coming from uh, Guinea Radio, which is kind of a ground up thing, uh, but we've, uh, we've been following the, you know, the SCA and the JTRS and, and those, those modes of operation, which are kind of a, a top down uh, attitude. Uh, but I keep getting asked, why don't we have software defined radio in the field? Um, you know, there's some being pushed out there from a military perspective, but they still can't really do that well. Um, but to me, when it co what it comes down to is the complexity of software is so much greater than I think we, uh, we wanted to recognize when we, when we all started this type of uh, work. Um, we do some really good software, uh, but at the same time, we as people generally, we're really bad at software. Uh, we're really bad at actually making huge complex software systems work well and work reliably. Uh, so I'd like to actually address that through, and I, we heard some great stuff already today about complexity, complexity theory, and how maybe we can make that stuff work a little bit better. Uh, there's also a lot of things we can talk about about uh, programming languages. Uh, another issue that I would really like to see us uh, attack is I talked a lot in my, my uh, remarks about uh, coexistence. Uh, coexistence is something that's great when you can start hopping around spectrum, you can start, maybe you, you just get to choose which spectrum you're in based on uh, your sensing technology says, oh, this is free over here, let me just use that spectrum. Or maybe it's more of a shared access, uh, license type uh, shared access model, where, uh, okay, you're gonna give me this license to operate in this mode uh, over on this one here. Uh, if we're all doing that, though, how do we discover our uh, who's where? Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, you know, this has been one of the things is, okay, if, if we can optimize waveforms, how do we actually communicate uh, as a larger network within, uh, within this, this kind of more dynamic thing? You can tune in DC. You tune to DC 101.1 because you know that's a frequency. What if it's no longer the frequency? How do you actually discover that mode? Uh, so we're talking about some like dynamic spectrum DNS uh, type operations. Um, and then the final one I just want to point out, and I think we, we want to talk about this a lot. You guys can, can jump in here. Power. Uh, power, the complexity of the software radios to do all the stuff that we can do. We can do some amazing things like active cancellation, uh, active interference cancellation, again, this dynamic type of stuff. Every time we add one of those new modes of operation, we're also driving the m number of watts that uh, device is going to consume. Uh, and that's really going to hit our battery limits very, very quickly. So either think about how to do more uh, with less or figure out how to get more battery and more power into these systems to uh, make this stuff possible. Okay. Uh, well, so the uh, DARPA Spectrum Challenge, uh, which Tom mentioned a, a bit uh, during his time, uh, was an, an incredible success. And, uh, and so what I would uh, really love to see is uh, the, uh, the DARPA Spectrum Challenge 2.0. And um, the, the thing I would change about it, I mean, there's sort of like a, a scale, and I'd love to see it bigger uh, and, uh, and more open and, and free, uh, free form for the users, uh, for the uh, participants. But really, the thing, the thing to me that, uh, that I'd most like to see change about it in, in a, a 2.0 would be uh, more encouragement, some way to get more of, of what people develop and create shared uh, and, and uh, uh, opened up to the community. Um, in, in the first one, we had some uh, incredible work done. Uh, there were teams that came up with communication systems that got through in incredibly bad conditions with just active, uh, aggressive interferers right on their signal. And, uh, and it would be great if, if some of them had, uh, had shared that and made it more available to others to build on, to analyze, to see how they did it. Um, and and so, so that would be the, the, the thing I would change about it, would be, it would be to add, uh, encourage that in some way so that um, more uh, repeatable science comes out of it. I don't, yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. I, I mean, I'm the open source guy, right? So sure, that's great. Sharing is awesome. And you can incentivize sharing as part of a program. How do you incentivize sharing in that mode? I mean, I'd love to do that, but, but there has to be some kind of incentive to play right. that way. Well, yeah, and, and so, I mean, I think to some degree, sharing is just naturally disincentivized. So perhaps it, it's not even incentivized, just remove the disincentives of it takes extra effort and uh, you know, I gotta find a place to host it, I gotta post things, I have to- Oh, my to, code's not ready yet. I, my it's code's not ready yet. So if you, if you, even if you just actively encourage people, I think uh, uh, 
uh, th that you'll get more sharing. And it, sometimes it's just about individually saying, hey, that's some really great work. Do you mind if, we, if it gets posted? I can handle that for you uh, so that they don't have to go through the extra effort. So perhaps it's just removing the disincentive um, uh, for, for sharing of, you know, of the effort. Right. Uh, and I think part of that is also cultural, and, and this, is, mm -hmm. this is true, I think, generally for sort of these open source, but as well as, you know, for example, some of these things I was talking about with you know, writing these generators and then potentially having them available. You know, as you were kind of hinting at, people say, oh, no, it's not ready. It doesn't work in all these different ways. You know, here's these issues, and you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed sort of this thing, yeah. right? And so I think just kind of getting people to foster this culture of, okay, hey, here's this thing. It does something. Be clear about what it does, but people can actually make use of that, right? And so you really have to sort of build that, that culture up so that mm -hmm. people are then comfortable actually sharing what they've done and, you know. Yeah. You know it's yeah. a great model for that? Stack Overflow. <laughs> Nobody actually programs Android. You just look up your, your, your thing that you want to do and you just copy and paste from Stack Overflow. I mean, it's really, we're kind of like these Frankensteining these like monster applications from that sense. But it is that model of, hey, I have this idea, I have this solution, I'm going to post it, but it's within this constraint right. of how you can use it. And, and I think part of that is also, and, and again, Alberto touched upon this uh, earlier this morning, and despite him being at Berkeley, I'm going to slightly disagree with him. Um, you know, he kind of said, oh, just you know, throw away all the details so that you know, someone can just grab something. If it doesn't work, fine, you know, just throw that thing out, try something else. Uh, I think the other really sort of important skill that, that we need to develop in kind of this generation of people is essentially the, the just-in-time abstraction, right? So you, you abstract something as long as it works, and then the moment it doesn't, you, you dig in and you figure out what really went wrong. Right, so if there's a piece of open source software, hardware, whatever it is, and something doesn't, doesn't work, you, you still have people available that can dive in and say, oh, no, okay, there was some assumption we made that's just not right, but let's patch this up, and now it'll work for people in the future. Yeah. Uh, do you think that there are some uh, best practices for government agencies interacting with open source communities in terms of both uh, benefiting from and contributing to an interaction with an open source community? Because you know, typically the government thinks about interacting with individuals that are affiliated with particular organizations like a university or a company, and this notion that they're gonna be, you know, interacting with an anarcho-syndicalist collective <laughs> may, may be a little bit countercultural. So uh, do you have some advice for uh, government agencies that recognize the power of open source communities and, and are trying to figure out what are types of win-win collaborations and, and what are some do's and don'ts that, that you would give to government agencies and, and maybe some uh, promising practices that you would point to as, as instances where government has done this well. Well, from my perspective, one of the biggest uh, benefits to our community in the past few years has been uh, the GNU Radio Conference. Um, so finding support for that has been a huge win for us as a community to bring people together, to collaborate, to talk about our ideas. Um, and I, we, it was a massive success this year. Uh, so funding something like that, I don't think should be that, uh, particularly difficult. Uh, we have had NSF support for stuff like that in the past, so, that, so that's, been, uh, that's been a particular win for us. Uh, but yeah, um, things of the nature that allow us to get together to bring developer community, because you know, we're all over the, the world uh, as, a, as a development community in open source. Uh, and sometimes it is just good to have bodies in the same room talking the same language for a week or so just to get those, the ideas really rolling. And it really it, it re-energizes the community when you get together like that. Yeah. I, I would say, yeah, I think GNU Radio has done really well in this regard. We have a lot of uh, uh, people within the government and the defense contractor community who are members of our community. And I, and I think really... Uh, I mean, it, it's great if sort of an organi a government organization wants to <coughs> fund this and make it happen, but uh, it's, it's really important to have not just like throw money, but to have people there. So mm -hmm. uh, if, if, you know, to use DARPA as an example, it, it's not just some money, but have somebody from that organization in as part of the community. And, and that's really, uh, uh, and because really the community operates on a person-to-person -person basis not on an organization-to-person basis. Right. And so just, just, having, just being a part of it and having a guy, oh yeah, he happens to work for this agency, but he, he's a guy who checks in, in code, right? right. That, yeah. that's, that's really Yeah, key, so I think I out think. of the three of us, I have the, the least experience with this, but I think to, to maybe rephrase it in another way, I think you know, sort of 
being open and, and sort of having that open communication channel is really critical, right? So that there's a, a person associated with it, and you know, you can go and they're they're checking in code, they're telling you know why why they did what they did, and obviously there's certain things that you know the government should not be telling everybody, um, but you know to the extent that they're a part of that community and there you know there's there's overall efforts that they're trying to leverage, being able to contribute back, I think really builds the credibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And in non-financial ways, I should yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point of what Matt raised about how it, communities are people to people. There is this idea, you know, since the success of GitHub, but there's this idea that, oh, I put an open source project out onto GitHub, and then months later, oh, why didn't the community just develop around it? Right, because communities are actually really, really difficult to grow uh, and and uh, and expand over, and it took it took you know a decade for GNU Radio to really reach the mass that it is today, uh, with really sustained effort. And uh, what do you think were some of the success factors in in having it uh, a critical mass of contributors and and developers? The success factors for the project, yeah, uh, the amount of bugs squashed per week these days, um, <laughs> you know, the amount of bugs created has probably also uh, increased, but the amount of bugs squashed uh, has has been uh, dramatic. The, uh, but then it's really what Matt pointed out, the, this archive of, uh, of all the GNU Radio projects that are out there. You know, we were able to build that. We actually, we, we have these uh, like code sprints or hack fests, we call them, uh, where we get together and we actually put together this you know, archive network so that people could actually post their code. So all this stuff that I talk about, the Internet of Things and all these different waveforms, you know, those are now available in one location. Uh, so the contributions from the community to, to do this new communication standard or protocol uh, have all come out because we now have more people interested in uh, mm -hmm. contributing. And, and what do you think are the respective roles of the, the expert versus the hobbyist or, or in, uh, enthusiast in this area? What are the areas where you, know, you really still need that uh, someone who has deep uh, technical expertise like a, uh, you know, PhD in electrical engineering, and what are those areas where you see, uh, you know, individuals without that level of technical training being able to make a significant contribution? Well, I, I, I think there's a lot of different projects within a, a larger community mm -hmm. open source project, and they're at different levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a, a professor from University of Michigan who does a very complex state machine-based uh, Viterbi algorithm. And, um, and you know, very, very high level stuff that he's probably the only person who really understands what's going on in there. <laughs> um, at the other end, you have, you have regression testing, you have build farms, you have website, you have um, uh, GUI code, and there's all sorts of pieces that people at different levels can contribute to. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest barriers to contribution is people think they have nothing to offer. And uh, it, it, you know, e even if you're just answering someone else's questions based on s somebody previously answered a similar question and you're able to rephrase it, you're able to add something. And so it's just making sure people are comfortable, that make, they understand mm -hmm. that they're able to contribute, and uh, bringing them in. Uh, and, and that being said, a lot of really exciting stuff comes from the hobbyists and uh, who are doing very high-level work. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's part of this whole, you know, process of of uh, opening this up and democratizing it to sort of overuse the word, but um, is, is making sure that everyone can actually contribute something useful. Right, so I guess I'd, I'd like to maybe answer the question but then twist it around a little bit uh, for my own purposes and you'll see why I say this in a second. Um, you know, much to my chagrin, but you know, it, it is what it is. You know, I think when you when you really get into sort of, you know, board design, and you know, let alone even that, you know, analog stuff, right, that's, not necessarily PhD level, but you know, you, you need some expertise. Yep. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think that will be changing immediately, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, there, there's certainly progress that can be made there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think you there mean is an English major won't be able to use the Berkeley Analog Generator. We, we will see. Uh, you know, I will try. Um, you know, I do have a few English major students in my in my class. So I will attempt to uh, recruit them. Uh, but in, in all seriousness, actually, directly on that note. You know, one of the problems that I think we very much face is that things have gotten now complicated enough that, you know, it's no longer the case you can open a box up and look at it and kind of say, oh, I, I kind of understand something mm -hmm. about this even if I haven't gone and done some PhD level classes, right? right? Um, and so I think it's very much on us as a community to, to kind of go back and figure out how do we capture those people's imaginations, mm -hmm. right? How do we get them things like, you know, SDRs or, or Arduinos and et cetera? How do we get those things in their hands and kind of show them, look, there's really powerful, cool stuff that you can do with this. And mm -hmm. hey, if you really want to figure out how to make this the best thing you can make it, here's this whole path of classes and et cetera mm -hmm. you can take to, to actually get to that expertise that mm -hmm. would let you solve the problem you really care about. I mean, are, do you think there are 
Um, so one of the things we talked about in the previous session is that historically, if you talk to a lot of scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs, they'll talk about different entry points that they had. So you know, for a lot of scientists, it was they had a chemistry set when they were growing up and they had the opportunity to blow things up. And unfortunately, we've taken most of the interesting chemicals out of chemistry sets. <laughs> um, a lot of people will talk about you know, ham radio as something that got them interested uh, in, in wireless technologies. Do you think that uh, you know, clearly uh, uh, lots of kids get involved in first robotics? I mean, it's still a very small fraction of the overall uh, you know, K through 12 population, but that's another entry point. What are some in, in the wireless, and, and do you think the, the, the wireless community could do a better job of creating some of those initial entry points? So um, we've got uh, support in GNU Radio, just as an example, for $20 dongles that were intended for digital television watching. And it's $20, you, you plug it into a USB port on any computer, or even now a, a, a cell phone, and you can run GNU Radio on it and do really interesting things. Mm -hmm. Like up to two gigahertz. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually use them in our classes. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and so they're, they're an incredibly, it's, it's a, I, I mean, we try to keep our you know, systems as, as low cost as possible right. to get an entry point. But $20 is an incredibly low barrier, barrier to entry. Right. Right. And, and so you've got that there. And, and we actually are seeing, um, I mean, ham radio is, is ham radio. And, um, but I, I think really SDR and GNU Radio are the ham radio mm -hmm. of today. And uh, we, there was a, uh, a high school student actually who, who started out with those, uh, those RTL dongles and uh, he's, um, you know, he, he wrote some apps and he's, he's uh, doing a bunch of interesting stuff with GNU Radio with it. And we, we found out about him because I saw a video of him giving a talk to a, uh, a technical group uh, was composed of almost everybody was over 40 in this group, and he's 14. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw this video on YouTube. I was like, wow, this kid's really getting involved. And we invited him to the office, and we, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he spent a day sort of shadowing our, our applications engineer and doing cool stuff. Um, but it's really exciting to see that. And, mm -hmm. and I think back, wow, when I was 14, which is around when I got into ham radio, it, it was, the, the radios were simpler, but it was a lot harder to get involved. You know, I couldn't, do, I couldn't spend 20 bucks and, and you know, be demodulating all sorts of satellite signals and, and crazy <laughs> things like that. Right. So, so we, the, the barrier to entry has really, really dropped. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's, that stopped surprising me uh, with, you know, you get your RTL dongle and you, you plug it in, uh, but it's not surprising me when they plug it into their, their computer, their laptop, and they run an FM demodulator. And they get super excited about getting an FM demodulator that they've done themselves, even though they've just built a two to three thousand dollar FM demodulator. It's still a revelation that they first, like the first time in their lives, they've really gotten to do their own thing with the radio yeah. system. Yeah, even people who've been engineers for twenty years, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get, it, you get you an their, excitement about yeah. that, mm -hmm. and and it's that that rapid uh, reward cycle that that's really really great for it. And yeah, so, so from there, oh, no, so, so, so from from there, you you're you're. Uh, you're introducing them to something new, but you're also raising the experts. So that's the next generation is going to come from from those. So so we're helping uh, get those experts kind of going and started, uh, which is something that you know. This is one of the things that came up in uh, our last uh, GRCon. Is there's so much uh, space happening in this uh, community right now with software, radio, wireless, radar, all the things we do with uh, RF signals that everybody that came to GRCon was either hiring or there to, to be hired. But we actually had more hire, people trying to hire than we had uh, people able to be hired at this point. So there is this, uh, this growth of, of uh, expertise that we need. And at least I have seen, since we've been doing software radio, since we've been doing, I've been doing GNU radio, I have seen the level of education elevate uh, through the universities. The students coming out now have a much better understanding of real signals, real signal processing, real RF, antennas, all of these things together. So they're now participating in the conversation at a much higher level uh, than they have in the past where they were just coming from a simulation and a textbook reading uh, scenario. Yeah, so I wanted to, to emphasize that a little bit. Um, so we we're actually in the middle of sort of going through an exercise of redesigning our, our sort of introduction to electrical engineering class at Berkeley. And I was involved in this along with a team of many other people. Uh, but you know, one of the things that, that we really did realize and we're trying to address is exactly what kind of what you're saying is, you know, even kind of trained engineers have never had the opportunity to like build this radio system themselves. Even if it's a super simple thing, they just 
it's really exciting when you get to see that. And so we, we, we indeed, you know, we grab these $20, you know, SDRs, you know, plug it in, get, get them to like hack a wireless light switch, right? And mm -hmm. for a lot of people, it's the first time they realize, oh yeah, this is like real stuff. Like right. I can actually do this. Yeah, um, right, right. So I think yeah. a, a really important part of all that is, you know, again, I think a lot of this is just getting people in the door in the first place to mm -hmm. realize that they can even do this, right? And so I think, even just kind of, if we were to put some effort into, you know, getting plugged into like the hacker community, right? And like just right. getting them to realize, oh yeah, actually like, I can I can mess around with wireless stuff. Like I don't I don't just have to write software that right. you know is randomly you know and seeing very, bits. <laughs> yeah, if I can pull this back to the, the question you had earlier, uh, this is potentially a place that government can play a huge role in, mm -hmm. which is moving this technology into undergraduate curriculums, but also down into the high school and possibly even middle school curriculums. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why they can't be playing around with this stuff uh, at that level, uh, which will help increase the pool of talent that we that we need in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also hoping that it increases the diversity of talent yep. uh, that we're looking for. Yep. Um, I want to wrap up by asking uh, you if, if you have a view on the policy side uh, to comment on that. Um, so recently, uh, the FCC, in response to a report that was issued by the President's Council of Advisors on, on Science and Technology, which had uh, some uh, former DARPA program managers like uh, Preston Marshall providing a lot of the technical input, uh, called for a, a much greater emphasis on on sharing as opposed to exclusive licensing. And the FCC responded to that with a proposal in the 3.5 gigahertz mm -hmm. band. So I'm wondering if you could comment on what opportunities you see there, but also what other things the administration should be considering to make the most of these new opportunities uh, with uh, wireless technologies and, and uh, you know, new, new approaches to spectrum management. Well, um, what I would say there is is really that um, one of the best things that the government can do is sort of stay out of the way on some of these things. Mm -hmm. And in, in particular, um, I mean, there's there's a new FCC uh, filing now, a, a notice of proposed rulemaking that has, has a lot of people concerned mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, certifying code before you can use it in SDR and things like that. And it, it's unclear what the ramifications will be, but... Um, uh, and and uh, I mean, one of the original reasons I got involved in, or the original reason we did the ATSC demodulator early on with GNU Radio was because there was a pending uh, uh, crazy rule in the FCC that we were going to not be allowed to uh, uh, make an HDTV receiver that didn't respect this copyright flag. Mm -hmm. And so you couldn't record, and it, it would imply that you could not make an open source um, HDTV receiver because even if you had a, a, a line of code that said shut down if you see this bit, somebody would delete that line. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, th there's, there, there's a lot of ways to, to mess things <laughs> up there. And, and so, uh, you know, so avoiding those, avoiding shutting down um, innovation is important. On the other side, I would like to see uh, Spectrum Playground. So this 3.5 gigahertz uh, PCAS stuff is mm -hmm. great. Um, uh, but it's not always clear whether an individual or a group or you know mm -hmm. who, who can just go and mm -hmm. like okay I've got some radios let's let's try something out mm -hmm. like do I have to file something do mm -hmm. I have to you know what if I have bugs and I mess up the somebody who's paid for this sharing spectrum right. and thing things like that or you know what if I take out somebody's Wi-Fi so just a, a playground mm -hmm. or a, okay if you stay under this power level and uh, you, you know you're you're covered and and as long as you're not doing anything malicious you're okay so making and, experimentation easier yeah and there are some playgrounds out there you know you got wind lab and then uh, I guess the genie project is trying to have like some wireless test beds and there's there's NTIA has been involved in this kind of planning of the test bed I forget the, the details of that one um, but you're right, there's still, it's unknowns, right? There, we still yeah. don't really know how we can play there. They're also very rigid. I mean, WinLab has been great for a lot of uh, analysis and study, but it is a rigid placement of radios yeah. without, you know, necessarily great propagation models or, you know, yeah. reality kind of, you know, reality checks in there. Yeah, I, I would say when I, when I said playgrounds, I meant more like, here's a few megahertz that anybody can go and use, right? right. Or um, in, in the larger sense, not necessarily a test bed, but. But that's um, the thing, that's what I'm saying, is we have those test beds and they we, do we have, have that beds, ability, yeah. but because you can't really move around there, you're, yeah, you're right. still limited to, okay, what do we, what's the, the box that we're Right, and even there, there, it's, a, you know, the, you're, you're transmitting on a, on a frequency with something that's not, a lot, you know, y y y even there, there's a, a question, right? Nobody's gonna, the FCC's obviously not gonna come in and shut down WinLab, but yeah. there's always that question, there's always this uncertainty, and right. if you could just take it away and make it so that people don't have to be afraid yeah, to just, experiment. And I know you love to say something, but 
uh, just just to, to actually uh, comment off what one thing you said about using the unlicensed bands. The unlicensed bands are great, but we have to remember we don't actually have a license to to, to transmit in the unlicensed bands. Yeah, they're not unlike they're they're regulated. They're just uh, regulated to be a certain you know part 15 before you can actually transmit in those unlicensed bands. So it's not like it's just a playground for all of us right. to uh, to throw stuff out there. There still is a regulatory steps Correct. that you have to take. Correct. Yeah. So I mean, I guess maybe since it sounds like it'll be wrapping it up somewhat. Um, and since I'm the academic in the room, I can take the extreme position because I don't, you know, I don't have to actually build it at the end of the day. Um, you could say that more research is needed. Yeah, no, well, that's certainly true. Uh, you know, that, that's obvious. Uh, right, no, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's always, yeah, anyways. Um, slightly more seriously, though, um, you know, I, I think it is clear that there are many, many issues with the current model, you know, mm -hmm. both economic yeah. and, and technical. Um, and so I, I do strongly believe that, that you know, we, we need to keep sort of marching more towards the less licensed type of model mm -hmm. and more towards you know the vision that the bill was outlining earlier today where you know we mm -hmm. we put in place intelligent rules that are adaptive to the particular situation you're doing and not sort of this blanket okay this is mine you right. know and that you know that's how it is right uh, well great job guys uh, please join me in, in thanking our terrific panelists